This webinar is uh, focused on practical ways to gather data and analyze output and manage the process of creating IT budgets and forecasts that matter. Budgeting and forecasting are a significant challenge for many organizations. It's not so much the challenge of getting numbers on paper as it is understanding and interpreting what those numbers mean. In that vein, we will first begin by defining budgeting and forecasting and their purpose before we discuss ways to better gather data, analyze output, and manage the process. Now, budget is typically the highest level grouping of numbers. Its primary purpose is to align dollars to a strategy that the organization is trying to achieve. A forecast is an interim plan that gauges the current state of the organization's financials and the attempts to capture the risks and opportunities that lie ahead, typically during a budgeting cycle. And actuals are represent what, are, what was achieved so far uh, through the year and become a baseline for comparison between budgets and forecast. Now these three views, budget, forecast, and actuals, are significantly different in their content, the detail, and their purpose. And as a result, inherently, they are not easy to compare. Ultimately, it's not the budget, it's not the forecasts, and it's not the actuals that drive the conversations or the challenges within an organization. Ultimately, it is the variance between them that matters. A variance within an organization is the key element that most organizations are trying to understand when it comes to comparison between budgets and actuals, forecasts and actuals. To define a variance analysis, uh, a variance, most organizations have an ultimate goal to ch achieve some kind of result. That result, a strategic intent, uh, is defined through whatever it is that they have in terms of a budget set up. Now, a variance occurs when the results that they're actually achieving are different from those goals, and a variance is used to measure the difference between whatever they desired and what was actually achieved. And it's important to keep in mind that variances are not inherently good or bad. The value of a variance is it provides insight into what needs to be different in order for the organization to achieve the results that they originally targeted. Now, variances get measured in a lot of different ways, and there's many things organizations can and do measure in order to determine variances. Among the most common are categories where the actual unit of measure is dollars. These are categories where you could include things like revenue, expense, profits, and there's others as well. Now there's also variances that can be measured that are not related to dollars. There are things like customer retention or employee turnover or an inventory turnover as examples. The challenge is that most organizations commonly measure their variances in dollars. And that very common category called expense is typically made up of units that are dollars. The challenge is we often interpret dollars as the actual thing that we're measuring because of the units we use to measure and the fact that dollars actually exist. But to be really effective at leveraging variances, we have to understand that the dollars are just a proxy for a measurement of what is really happening. The dollars are acting as a common way to talk about the things that make up the organization but it's actually different units that we're measuring underneath. So for example, dollars could represent labor, but we're actually measuring headcount, or dollars could represent hardware, software, but what we're actually measuring is servers or databases or licenses that we own. Dollars could represent rent, but what we're actually managing is square feet. To be really effective at leveraging variances, we must understand dollars are just a proxy for what is really happening. If you agree that dollars themselves are not the things we want to measure, but are just a proxy for those things, then you can begin to see why planning and forecasting using just dollars completely undermines an organization's ability to deliver quality variance analysis. It also becomes more obvious that you need to capture in planning and forecasting the activities the dollars are representing, the key assumptions that drive those activities. So quality variance becomes 
uh, an analysis of identifying the difference between the assumed activities and the actual activities and the reason that those assumptions that were planned didn't actually pan out. Budgeting. So again, an organization's ultimate goal is to achieve results. Hopefully that sounds familiar. A budget serves as a way to measure those goals, and the dollars are, again, typical units that are being used to measure the goals. Now, when we budget, we tend to group those dollars into categories to give us at least some insight as to what type of activity they are. So we've already talked about revenue, expense, and profit, but there's some subcategories, too, like salary or travel or hardware or software. But again, the value of budgeting is that budget gives us that point from which we begin to measure all of our variances. But there's a challenge with measuring budgets in dollars. Organizations are often satisfied with a few subcategories with dollars in them. Some organizations ask for groups planning to do some additional activity type planning. So they may ask for a staffing model or a hardware purchase plan. But these activities often do not include what I call the what for answer. And this makes it very hard for us to understand, even when we've done some staff modeling or, or some hardware purchase plans, exactly what it is that we're trying to get done with that budget. In my experience, you eventually have to answer the what for question. It's just a dependent, it just depends on how long it takes for it to become a challenge. Some what fors don't get asked for years and then they become extremely difficult to answer. The other thing that happens is that when we only budget with dollars, there's an assumption that every dollar is equal in its ability to impact or our ability to impact it. So for example, if you ever gotten the mandate to cut 5%, well, there's an assumption that every dollar that's in your budget is equally available to achieve that 5% cut, but in fact, it is not. And forecasting, again, an organization's ultimate goal is to achieve results. I think I've said that three times now, and hopefully that makes a lot of sense. Our forecast is a response to the difference between where we are and where we want it to be. If a budget serves as a way to measure goals we're trying to achieve and a variance occurs when a results achieved are different from the goals we wanted, then a forecast is our response to the difference between where we are and where we want to be. Now, typically, again, dollars are used as the measure for most organizations. And dollars are typically grouped into categories that mirror what we had in the budget originally as well because we're trying to do some kind of comparison between them. The forecast has value in that it tells us how we can plan to respond to the fact that the actuals are different than the goals that we are trying to achieve. Again, the challenging of measuring dollars for the forecast. Organizations are often satisfied with a few subcategories with dollars in them. Other times, again, they ask for groups forecasting to do some additional activity type planning. Could be a staffing model update, could be a purchase plan for hardware updated, but these activities, again, seldom have that what for answer in them. And you have to answer that what for eventually. And with the forecast, that usually happens close to year end when the forecast is significantly over understated as compared to actuals. Again, we have the challenge that we're using dollars, and the assumption is that every dollar in a forecast is equal in our ability to impact it. We know this because we see plugs in forecasts in some of the craziest expense accounts, negative numbers that you could never actually achieve, but the assumption is that all the dollars within that forecast are the same. So the challenge of budgeting and forecasting and actuals. Budgets and forecasts are typically completed at a different level of detail than actuals. Um, so when we create a budget and we create a forecast, we do not have within those um, uh, uh, creations the level of detail that we typically see coming through actuals. We're not planning at the per salary line. We're not planning at the invoice level line. We go in and we build cost models typically around how we want to see our actuals uh, align going forward. 
and that level within the cost model is typically too detailed to be effectively leveraged for a budget and a forecast. And we also have the challenge with actuals is that they don't come built with inherent assumptions in them. Somebody has to go in and add assumptions into those. So there has to be a way to unify the views between budgeting and forecasts and actuals in order to produce what we call quality variance analysis. So the first step on this journey is this concept of called the what for question. It's a very simple question and the goal is to drive a better variance conversation. For every expense that gets planned or forecasted, there should be an answer to the question, what for? What is this expense for? And if we have what for commentary built into our plans and forecasts, we can begin to build a way to come up with a much better way to understand the variances between actuals, plan, and forecasts. Couple of examples, a good answer for what for. Um, we have a salary expense that's entered into a plan or a forecast, and we have a comment, the salary pays for development labor. That's a good answer because at least we understand what those dollars are for. But a better answer to that is the development capacity, either historically or the current demand says I need 10,000 hours. This salary dollar is for one of six resources to deliver that capacity. So now I know that if I come in over or under that salary plan, I have something I can go and look at. Did I have seven resources when I had planned on six? Did I not have 10,000 hours? Did I only have 8,000? So I begin to understand the driver behind that variance. When we have what for questions as the basis for what we're doing, we can also begin to build what for categories. And those categories can help us aggregate what for comments up into higher levels so that we can begin to do higher level analysis tracking and look for trends and other things that we need to consider in the process. So we have to solve this challenge in the fact that we have a lot of data and information in the typical planning and forecasting system and a ton of information and data inside of our typical actuals uh, processes where we gather the expenses for the organization but those never provide for us the kind of context we need in order to really get after good forecasting, good planning, and more specifically, the variances that we're trying to analyze. In order to get from data and information up into context and insight, we have to have a method and a mechanism by which we can add that context. In this diagram we're talking about, you can get for most of the uh, systems in an organization today, data and information about planning and forecasting and actuals, and you can get a little bit of context. That is that you'll see dollars in categories like salary, travel, training. You'll see them in a cost center grouping that tells you sort of where that dollar sits in the organization and gives some insight to what it's for, and it usually is typically planned by month. But what we don't have is the what for assumptions and the categories that we need to really drive better understanding and analysis. In order to address this challenge, we have to think through systemically how can we close the gap and gather in that additional insight and context that we need in order to have a better understanding of the variance between forecast and planning and actuals. And this chart just kind of shows cost centers and expense accounts give you data information and a little bit of context, but it's what for assumptions, categories for what for, and driver categories that provide additional context and then ultimately, we have to do analysis in order to uh, really get after insight. To do this effectively, particularly in a large organization, requires a preferred method where there's some sort of systemic approach so that we can have consistency, we can drive this process at some level of frequency, preferably monthly, and we have some level of control so we don't have all kinds of craziness uh, coming in and impacting our ability to do analysis. So let's talk a little bit about the different methods for which you can go about creating the process and closing the gaps. The first step on this journey is what I call the what for data sheet. This is a place where I can go and begin to create the ability to gather into my process the additional insights and context that I need in order to drive that variance analysis that I need to perform between planning and forecasting and actuals. Most of our ERP systems that exist today allow for an extract 
that I can come out with and really get both the dollars, a cost center, and an account line, for example, salary. So it's pretty easy to establish the sheet to begin with in terms of what dollars are in what categories that we typically plan in. But by adding some, some additional metadata onto this, such as well, what for comment, a what for category, and a driver category, I can begin to build out and close the gap between the kind of planning that I'm doing and the understanding I have about those numbers when I'm planning them. So when the actuals come in, I have something to compare against. And when I go to forecast, I can provide a rationale for why that forecast does or does not make sense. So the comments provide a basis for assumptions that enable the variance analysis. The categories provide groupings that allow me to aggregate and de-aggregate so that I can start to drive insights. Now our recommendation and the way we like to approach this, a what for category is going to typically line up to what I'm going to talk about in a minute, which is an alternative model inside of a software product like vRealize so that I inside that model to house these numbers in a context that's going to make sense relative to my cost model. The driver category is categories that I typically see inside of a budgeting process. So they might be things like uh, demand or inflation uh, or uh, consumption changes that are really outside the parameters of what I would put inside of a cost model, but common for how I want to talk about my plan or my budget uh, as I aggregate it up to uh, business units. So the what for data sheet becomes that baseline by which I can begin to create um, that level of uh, data that will help me drive for uh, insight and context as I move forward. So then we have to think about an alternative cost model. So when we think about a tool like vRealize and we recognize that the primary cost model that we build inside of there is typically uh, geared toward helping me uh, understand what's happening with my actuals. And so it's built to bring in lots of detailed data and it is then used that detailed data to group the, the costs into uh, groupings that make sense in terms of services or products that I provide that I can get unit cost off of. Uh, and eventually get to, to how I charge that out to the business. By creating an alternative cost model within the system, I can begin to use that what for data sheet as a primary feeder for helping me to create a comparative view for budgets and forecasting where I don't have all that detail that I would have from an actual standpoint. I want to go in and I want to use my current model that I'm using for actuals as the baseline. I'm just going to strip out potentially some of the hierarchies or some of the complexity so that the model doesn't have to have every little element in it. But I want it closely coupled enough that I can actually see a forecast, for example, of a unit cost of a particular service that I've defined within my cost model for actuals. And I can see that forecast as it would be charged out uh, to a business unit as well. So all of that impact relationship is still there. I'm just recognizing I don't have that level of detail coming into it. Best case alternative is this, this alternative model is used for both budgeting and forecasting. So I really want to take a look at how I plan within my organization, what categories of planning I use, what level of detail I typically plan at, and in a similar view, look at forecasting and balance between the two of those so that I can use the same model. While it's possible to have a forecasting model and a budgeting model, I don't particularly recommend it because then you have three places you have to do your comparisons from, um, and this just makes the process a little more seamless and a little easier to manage, less uh, uh, different uh, places I have to go in order to see all the views. Now I can unite these views in a report format so the cost models themselves within the tool will not touch each other, but I can unite them in a query for a report. So I can design reports that pull this information and have it sit side by side so that I can view it. And that really leads us to the, the last leg of this journey is now I have that reporting created and I'm looking at what I'm doing with that reporting and the analysis that I can generate. The reporting needs to support the categories and groupings that we talked about previously. So if we think about the what for uh, context and we're talking about the categories there, we'll want those categories to line up pretty uh, uh, distinctly with how we do charge back or do show back within our, our uh, cost model. We'll want the uh, driver categories to line up with the categories we typically use for uh, planning and forecasting 
so that we can show the, the context of the driver as well. Uh, we want to use visualization techniques, so if you look inside the vRealize tool, there's a lot of different visualizations that you can get for your um, what four categories to help you see uh, unit cost variances uh, and uh, uh, consumption variances that would be part of that analysis. And as we look at categories for drivers, we would want to use things like a waterfall that you see here um, as a way to provide some additional insight and context. We then have preserved and can use side by side the what for uh, data sheet to look at the commentary. So as we go to actually build out the analysis around what is driving the variances between plan, forecast, and actuals, we can actually use those comments to help us understand uh, with a little more detail the validity of what the forecast is that's coming through or the variance analysis that is coming through. We can look for repetition, uh, some macroeconomic drivers um, that could potentially need to be addressed uh, within that whole process. But this gives us now really three ways to look at those numbers consistently and have a good understanding of what each and every one of them is doing as we complete our analysis uh, for our variances. So just to kind of bring all these concepts together into one place. So although we talk about planning and we talk about forecasting, um, really the thing that matters most is our ability to understand the variance. And we want to be able to see that variance and analyze that variance in a way that is consistent and thorough and complete, a good quality variance analysis that really enables us to understand the drivers of the change between where we were trying to head and where we actually are. So the process, we have to gather context. So we have to improve the context in which we're gathering information uh, from the organization as part of our processes for planning and forecasting. We have to look at the modeling that we're doing within our enterprise standard tool sets and leverage off of that actuals view, recognizing that the forecasting and planning processes typically don't have that level of detail. And then as always, we have to provide the necessary analytics through the whole process. So we've discussed how quality variance analysis is a key to getting value from budgeting and forecasting and that process within the organization. We identified that the most significant challenge with quality variance analysis is the assumptions that we're using to measure the dollars um, and that we're using dollars to measure and not necessarily activities. We also recognize that all dollars are not equal. And by having this notion around categorization and commentary, we can begin to um, pull out in our analysis what dollars we can influence and what dollars we cannot. Once we recognize that dollars are in fact a proxy for activities, it becomes obvious that the common gathering process for budgeting and forecasting is missing that critical component. Solving that challenge requires some degree of automation and systemic control in order to produce these outputs that can be analyzed and interpreted. And as you can see, there's a lot of challenge in producing quality variance analysis. I found, however, as daunting as the upfront creation of the process may seem, it pays off well in its ability to quickly identify trends, correct forecasts, and create actionable insights. So I thank you for your time today, and we look forward to your thoughts and feedback on this approach. Thank you, William, for that uh, great presentation. Um, just have a couple questions to, to ask you for the audience. Um, one is, um, is there a software application or program that you would recommend for creating the what for data sheet that you talked about earlier on in the presentation? Uh, yeah, so I, I haven't found anything out there that actually works as well, quite honestly, as Excel. And if you want to get fancy with it, uh, you could do a little bit of access behind it. And the reason being is that we ultimately want to be able to create data that we can upload very easily uh, into uh, vRealize because we want to drive it up through that alternative model. Um, we've been able to manage 3,000 cost centers with 300 budget owners inputting through a set of data, um, sorry, Excel uh, spreadsheets attached to an access database and, and do it every month in a very timely manner. Um, and so that seems to be a very powerful way to get not only the flexibility you want, but the content you're looking for. Excellent, thanks. Um, and another one is, um, in your experience, you, I mean, you talked a lot about the uh, the value of the analysis and the reporting. Um, 
around the variance and to be able to visualize that and, uh, and leverage that data. In your experience, have you found that you've been able to create and get the desired reports and analysis from the vRealize business product that you talked about? Uh, yeah, so the reporting that is related to um, inside of the, the service um, design or the cost model that's inside of vRealize, you definitely want to do inside that uh, inside the vRealize tool. You want to be able to bring those two elements together and, and share them, and the tool does a nice job um, of, of coming up with and showing in, in the tabular format what those relationships are, and, and it keeps it very uh, simple to use and very quick to produce, which is, I think, key. When you're looking at some of the other reporting that's really more budgeting uh, related to how an organization might think about like uh, uh, inflation drivers or, or things like that, uh, you typically don't want to run that uh, through vRealize if you don't have that built into your cost model. So that I would extract separately and do that either in Excel or, or uh, some other reporting uh, function. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, that is all the time that we have today. Um, we appreciate your time um, and your expertise, William. Um, we look forward to uh, future webinars in this um, in this series. Thank you very much.